Ladies and gentlemen, my name is not Norman Gunson and I'm not here to talk about life assurance. I'm so sorry about that. It has been said, I heard it said only um, 45 seconds ago actually, it's a proud and lonely thing to be a fan. Well, I'm just looking around here and I don't feel awful lonely, but by God, I'm proud. <laughs> Um, for the two people in the audience who've forgotten my name, uh, my name is John Bankson, and uh, I, I'm your spokesperson tonight. Uh, your toast person. Um, I called myself toast person instead of um, toastmaster because I feel that there's something rather ridiculous about this business of differentiating between sexes in the titles of, um, you know. Right. I have no trouble differentiating between the sexes, so why should you? <laughs> no, really, what I wanted to say about that is that um, I call myself a uh, toast person because, um, first of all, I'm not making any toasts, uh, and secondly, because I want to make a point about, um, about language. It seems so utterly absurd that we get to this point where we're talking about chairperson. This has got nothing to do with the liberation of the sexes got nothing to do with liberation of women. This is something that's mucking about with language. Thank you. Man is all of us. Now, we just happen to be the male half, you know, as represented by me at the present time. <laughs> so that's why I'm not calling myself Toastmaster. I'm not going to call anybody master, mistress, man, person, or anything like that at all tonight because we're all men. We belong to the race of men. Um, you'll probably gather from that, and I, get, I, I hear a few grumblings around here, um, you'll probably gather them from that that language is pretty important to me, and, um, uh, and it is. Um, Ursula Le Guin was saying to me, um, I forget, you know, three weeks ago, it was probably two days ago actually, but we've been here so long it seems. Um, the first panel, can I tell you a story about this panel? They, they had me on this panel uh, entitled How to Really Enjoy Yourself at This Convention. You know, I think most of you were probably here and, you know, didn't know what was going on. I didn't either, you know. Um, and I started off by saying that the title needed to be sub-edited. It should be How Really to Enjoy Yourself at This Convention or something like that. And uh, I came down afterwards and I was all quaking, you know, um, about the way I'll be in two minutes from now. And uh, Ursula said, that was great, watching Banks and wrestling with a split infinitive on stage. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Ursula. <coughs> um, yes, uh, language is important to me. Uh, it's, it's, you know, I use it a lot. Um, I... I think I'm not too bad at language. Uh, I, I'm, you know, a lot better at it sitting in front of a typewriter than standing, you know, scared shitless in front of all you people. Uh, but I reckon I, you know, maybe I'm not too bad at language if, uh, you know, so many people are here tonight. Um, so, you know, why are you here? Um, but, um, you know, I've, I've talked a few people into coming into this uh, convention. Uh, so I can't be all that bad at language. And language does mean a lot to me, but there are other things that mean more. Um, um, <laughs> you know, a good night's rest and, um, you know, a bit of funny business and things like that. But the most important thing of the lot, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is friends. And um, for me, uh, forgetting science fiction for a moment, um, there's been a lot of talk about what is fandom? Is, is fandom just a goddamn ho hobby? Uh, is fandom a way of life? Uh, people seem to be split, you know, two ways about this. And, uh, you know, even individual people are split two ways about that. They've got a word for that. Um, but I've never subscribed to either entirely. So I'm split three ways. And uh, for me, um, against... Um, 
fandom is just a goddamn hobby and fandom is a way of life, I set up a new principle and, uh, you know, it's a very old principle, but I would like to see it adopted, um, you know, rather more widely than just um, around Kingston in Canberra, and that is that fandom is friends. And that's what I feel when I'm here. I have to say that in all the time that um, I've been involved with science fiction and fandom, there is um, one person who, for me, is, um, is and remains, and I believe will go on being the best and dearest friend that I've made through science fiction and fandom. And I have to report that she's not here. Um, that is our guest of honor, Ursula Le Guin. Um, I'm very sorry about this, but she's got the dreaded Melbourne collie wobbles, um, and she won't be able to be with us tonight. But I, I, I guess you feel the same way as I do. But we know that she's here and we're with us, and I know you'll understand. I think that's about all I... Look, I've got this uh, feeling this ambition, if you like. Uh, people who are toast persons at world conventions tend to ramble on and on and on and on. You know, um, well, I do that on, on my typewriter, you know, and people pay me money. Uh, some people pay me money to see the stuff that I've done, but that's where I ramble. And what I want to do is to set a world record in world conventions for getting through the awards part of the awards banquet um, in the shortest time possible. <laughs> that reason, I would just like to say a few words. <coughs> for that reason, I would like now to um, invite one of our fan guests of honours. Fan guests of honour. I, I care a lot about language. Susan Wood to come up here and say a few words. And Susan, as you come here, as a small token of our appreciation, this crummy little object. <laughs> it's a piece of plastic. Thank you, John. Um, yeah, um, I'd like to get the awards over with, too. Uh, so I'd just like to say that I've had a marvelous time here. I have the feeling that here I am, 26, and the rest of my life is going to be an anticlimax. Um, in fact, I've enjoyed myself so much that I went out to the University of Melbourne and tried to make some arrangements to get either a grant or a teaching position to come back here. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> thank, thank you very much for inviting me to have dinner with you all, and may I come back? <laughs> thank you. Um, our other fan guest of honour is Mike Wixon, and he's not getting out of it, so... Here's Michael Quickson. Um, would you like to sit on the night and day, have a bit of, um, you know, <laughs> have a plastic thing? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I just checked through the program book, falling apart, and I found that um, although this is the 33rd World Science Fiction Convention, I think there have only been 11 that have had fan guests of honor. So to point a cliche that was very popular in the auction this afternoon, this is a nearly unique experience. And <laughs> it is a, a tremendous honor, and I will have a tremendous number of beautiful memories of the time I've spent down here. It's only just beginning. There's only one-third of, of the way through the trip. I will remember drinking Rough Red with John Bankson here at the banquet and various other places, and then later on finding him in the urinal next to me as we prepared for the endurance test that we have to go through here. Um, I will remember seeing Bruce Gillespie drunk, which was one of the highlights of the trip for me. <laughs> I will remember Shane driving us from the Sydney airport, airport to downtown Sydney by way of the oil refineries along the coastline. <laughs> but most of all, I think I will remember something that I think the AussieCon committee deserves a great vote of thanks from me for. And this is um, something that you may not have noticed in your room. It's 
one of the cultural differences between North America and Australia, and that is that in preparation for the aftermath of the banquet, um, the Aussie Con Committee, being aware of great Fannish traditions, has provided a source of Alka-Seltzer in every room. Uh, this, this we do not do in North America, and it's something I think uh, we're falling down on. But, but more than that, um, when you get back to your room after the surprisingly good cold buffet we've just experienced down here, <laughs> If, if you'll take a look at this little folder that they have so graciously provided with you, you will find that on the inside, I'll, I'll hold it up, you won't be able to see it, but they have generously chosen me as a symbol of drunkenness in Australia. This <laughs> a, a little portrait of a man with lots of hair and a hat, and it's obviously supposed to be me, and I take this as a great compliment from the Aussie Con Committee, and I thank you all for inviting me down here too. Thank you. I have a confession to make, and that is that after all this time, you know, uh, the six weeks or so that we've been in this hotel having this convention, um, I still can't tell um, Bob Hevelin from Rusty, whatever his name is. Uh, and, you know, it's so hard to separate them. Uh, we tried to crow... No, we didn't. Um, but I, I would like to invite um, the winner of the um, Down Under Fan Fund for 1975, Rusty Hivlin to come and say a few words. <laughs> and to accept a bit of plastic without compliments. Well, thank you for the compliments and the plastic. <laughs> and my few words really are thank you. I want to thank all of you who voted and contributed to Duff, <coughs> whether you voted for Jan Howard Fender, or Finder as the case may be, or whether you voted for John Barry, who's sitting over here, or whether you voted... <coughs> well, he was. He sneaked over. He's over here. <coughs> or whether you voted for Rusty Hevelin, who ultimately stood up here and said these few things. Thanks to all of you. I've had a lot of fun here, and I hope to have some more tonight, tomorrow. I've met a lot of people here that I've truly enjoyed meeting and hope that they will be lasting friends. Although I don't correspond, I hope that I'll meet a lot of faces that I've met here. See you coming to the United States to our good conventions over there if you can make it. Thanks again. Um, naturally, I now have to um, enjoy the privilege of inviting the, um, the star of F-Troop, um, Bob Tucker, to come up and say his few words. <laughs> if he's around. There he is. Last month in Kansas City, I offered a brief program to the convention there in an effort to, to to better the conventions of the world, to enrich those conventions. I would like to offer the same program to you, and I hope that by your applause you will signify your approval. This has, program has five points. One, hucksters and their tables should be abolished. <laughs> hucksters are here only to rob us innocent fans. <laughs> Two, fan guests of honor should be abolished. These guests take up valuable time we could be spending in room parties. <laughs> Three, pro guests of honor should be abolished. We've done our best, Bob. They are here only to line their pockets at your expense. <laughs> Four, toastmasters and masters of ceremony should be abolished. <laughs> they are a damn nuisance. And five, convention committees should be abolished. <laughs> they only manage to screw up everything. <laughs> Thank you. Well, after those few words, um, 
Bob Tucker definitely doesn't get his little bit of plastic unless he comes back and asks me for it. It is now my, my, my you know, immeasurable pleasure. Um, I don't know how we're going to organize this because the committee did, did the basic planning. Uh, it's now my immeasurable pleasure to invite the entire awards committee for this convention to join me on the platform. <laughs> Mr. David Grip, the original, the only, original, Middle English Dwarf. <laughs> I'm not sure what David's doing up here, actually. Uh, but th the next thing here says that um, I'm to invite the entire Silverberg committee up here. Robert Silverberg. I'm not really the entire Silverberg Committee, but I'm many of them. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the elves, gnomes, and little men's science fiction chowder, chowder and marching society is an organization of science fiction fans in the San Francisco Bay Area, where, where I live. And each year, the little men present an award at the, the Westricon, which is the annual California Regional Science Fiction Convention, present an award known as the Invisible Little Man Award to an individual whose services to the world of science fiction have not been sufficiently rewarded with the other uh, pertinences and perquisites of uh, the science fiction world, uh, people who have served yeomanly in the, the vineyards without being festooned with Hugos and Nebulas and guests of honorship, uh, the, the unsung heroes. And this year, uh, for the first time, the Invisible Little Man Award uh, was given to an Australian. And I was asked, because uh, I'm one of the very few people of the, the San Francisco Bay Area who was coming to this convention, I was asked to, to carry the award over here and present it at the World Con Banquet. This is the Invisible Little Man Award. <laughs> and <laughs> the, uh, the winner this year is unsung, perhaps, in the United States, where his work, uh, though well-known and, and cherished for many years, has never received an award. But he has, of course, been honored many times in Australia. There are only two, two writers of any sort, uh, two Australian writers of any sort, who are known in the United States of America. Uh, one is Patrick White, and the other is A. Bertrand Chandler. Luckily, uh, Kendall Grimes was last heard of on King Solby's planet and has left no forwarding address. So it gives me great pleasure as um, Kendall Grimes, sort of uh, Dr. Watson, to his Sherlock Holmes, to accept this honor on his behalf. Thank you all.
I'd now like to um, call on one of the great figures in Australian fandom to come to the platform, a gentleman named Ronald E. Graham. I'm not going to explain why he's here. It's about time he explained himself. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Ron Graham. Ladies and gentlemen, each year, First Fandom tries to honour, or well does honour, I should say, someone whom they consider has given tremendous work for science fiction. First fandom you may know or you may not know, I'll just explain. There's a group of fans who were active in fandom in the very early days of science fiction. It's a last man society in that there's a cutoff point <coughs> in which they will accept members as far as years go. So consequently, the present members of First Phantom will be the only members of First Phantom unless there are others who can prove that they were entitled to be members. Now each year First Phantom honours some person or persons who have made outstanding contributions to science fiction. Over the years, a veritable galaxy of such people have been not so honoured. The first recipient of the honour was that very lovable character, Dr. Edward Elmer Smith. You'll all know him from his space opera fame. His Skylark of Space series and Lensman series are still being published at this day. The la last year there were two recipients of the first Phantom Award. We have one of them here with us this evening warm-hearted characters I've learned to know him, and I'm sure you all have, variously known to us all as Mr. Science Fiction, fan number one, Forry Forrest Guy. I speak, of course, of Forrest Guy Ackerman. <laughs> the other recipient, was the gentleman who was not being known as the historian of science fiction, Sam Moskowitz. Sam was not with us, unfortunately, tonight, but he, of course, has done a tremendous amount for science fiction also. The award this year goes to one of that tremendously talented group of New Yorkers who were members of First Phantom right from the inception of First Phantom. They have made tremendous <coughs> and valuable contribution to science fiction as fans, fanzine editors, publishers, authors and anthologists. Sam Moskowitz, one of the recipients I mentioned of last year's award, was one of that group. Others that come to mind quite easily are Richard Wilson, Frederick Pohl, Doc Lowndes, Isaac Asimov, and others, but the man to whom this year's award is being presented is an outstanding member of that talented group. A member of fandom from its first inception, he published many fanzines, one of which, the Fantagraph, became a legend in the field. As a writer under both his own name and many pseudonyms, he had a wealth of story he has a wealth of stories to his tell to his credit. He assembled to what is generally regarded is the first true science fiction anthology. He has edited a number of magazines and paperback series for various publishers. He now edits and publishes his own series of paperbacks, door books. He is, of course, Donald A. Walheim. In his younger days, Don was a controversial figure in the field, but he fought always for what he considered the eventual good of science fiction. The award which we present tonight has a eulogy on it, prepared by one of his great friends, lifelong friends from his very early days, 
stuck down, and I'd like to read it to you. From his very first writings as a science fiction fan, Donald A. Walheim has drawn attention to and promoted excellent examples of fantasy and science fiction and criticised Shoddy and ephemeral work in the field. He was the first to draw fans and young writers' attention to the unfair treatment that some publishers were giving inexperienced authors and to seek means of effective protest and restitution. His own stories reflected his conviction that science fiction should be both entertaining and thought-provoking. As a magazine and book editor and anthologist, he consistently encouraged authors, both old and new, and sought for them the best rates that were possible. As a publisher, he continues to seek excellent work and to give authors a square deal. His influence in the science fiction world has been wide, and he has always been on the side of authors who sought new ways of telling a good story and lasting values. Our field is richer today because of his efforts and is signed by Robert A.W. Lowndes. Now, unfortunately, Don isn't here this evening to take this prize. I'm going to ask Forrest Ackerman if he will take it on his behalf. Uh, there's just one further fact I can think of uh, to add about Donald Wolheim. It may not be known to most of you, but he was the first man to write a definition of science fiction into a dictionary. I was aware in advance that I was going to be asked to accept this. I had written a very fine acceptance speech for Don, but unfortunately it was turned into a sailplane and was last seen uh, <laughs> heading, <laughs> heading for table number 27. <laughs> if Don Wolheim were here tonight, I can imagine what thought might be passing through his mind, because incredible as it may seem, at the very first of all world science fiction conventions, he was not permitted entrance. Uh, it's a long forgotten feud, but the unholy three kept excluded uh, six of the fans of the day who've gone on to great glories. Uh, Frederick Pohl was one, and Doc Lowndes, whose eulogy you just heard, and, and Don Wolheim and so on. So I imagine it would be very gratifying to Donald Wolheim at this 33rd World Science Fiction Convention to have been so generously recognized by his peers. Thank you. strange thing about this, but um, I now have to ask um, uh, a gentleman who will be unfamiliar to you, um, but he did very well in a series called F Troop. Um, his name is uh, Forrest uh, something or other. Um, every year, um, Forry Ackerman presents at the World Convention an award called the E. Everett Evans Memorial Award, better known as the Big Heart Award, and I want Forry to come right back. You have a sense of deja vu that you have <laughs> seen me somewhere before. Uh, I'd like to deviate just for about two minutes before I give the award. We don't uh, allow any deviates uh, on this sort of convention. <laughs> no funny business. <laughs> On a, on a point of personal privilege, is there anyone present who was at the very first World Science Fiction Convention? I don't think so, other than myself. And I would just like to turn back the clock for a few minutes, the time when I was 22 years old, went off in 1939 to that rather ostentatiously titled World a Science Fiction Convention. Actually, there were only 200 of us there and I don't believe anyone from outside the continental limits of the United States. I was a very shy, introverted boy, and actually I <laughs> trembled for 3,000 miles with every clickety-clack of the railroad track across the United States just for fear that 
Now, sitting in the audience at that convention, someone might notice me, and because I, for 10 years, had been uh, filling the magazines with my letters of criticism, that just possibly they would say, oh, I, I do believe that's Forrest Ackerman. From, won't you stand, Mr. Ackerman? And I was so terrorized at, at the thought of just having to stand, not, not say anything, that uh, seriously, when I got to Chicago, 2,000 miles on the trip, I, and had to change trains, I was, I was tempted to turn around and go back home because I just didn't think I could face getting up before an audience. Well, 32 conventions later, I've only missed one in the intervening years, uh, somehow or other, I find myself a shy, introverted boy of going on 59, <laughs> and... Uh, From which direction? <laughs> <laughs> and with every pippity-pop of the, uh, the airplane prop, uh, 9,000 miles, I was... <coughs> I was terrified uh, that possibly I might not be recognized at this <laughs> <laughs> convention. <laughs> I look over all these happy, smiling faces at the, at the banquet, and I'm reminded of the first banquet of all. There were just 29 of us. Willie Lay was alive then. He sat at my left, as I recall. And would you believe that Ray Bradbury was not able to attend that convention because, or, excuse me, not the convention, but the banquet, because he couldn't afford it because of the outrageous price. It was one dollar a plate. Of course, no food, just, just a dollar for the plate, you know. <laughs> uh, that, you know, that same Ray Bradbury has told me on many occasions that he's $100 richer every morning when he wakes up and opens his mail because somewhere in the world someone wants him for another translation or a textbook. At night, he's about $850 richer because he discovered he has a golden voice and can go out. He's signed up for about six months in advance now at universities and colleges and and churches to speak on science fiction. And uh, at one point in his career, he sold a story for one dollar a word, every little a, and the, but, etc. He got one dollar for it. Matter of fact, Ray Bradbury is so rich, he has four daughters, and uh, for his youngest daughter's birthday just the other day, he bought her Disneyland. <laughs> yeah. The other three daughters were very envious of that, so he he quickly bought, uh, I believe it was the Hollywood Bowl, uh, Grandma's Chinese Theater, and Tijuana for the... Uh, <laughs> well, seriously now, I was uh, asked during the convention by one of you fans out there if I knew of any other work that E. Everett Evans had had published other than his novel Man of Many Minds. And I told this chap that there was a sequel to it called Alien Minds that had been published and uh, a uh, juvenile work called The Planet Mappers, and also uh, Evans had a collection of his work posthumously published called uh, Food for Demons. But it is not because of, of his uh, auctorial ability that we honor the memory of E. Everett Evans. It's about the 15th or 16th year now that we have given the award in his memory. Uh, Robert Block, was the first to receive it. It can go to a professional person, as it did in the case of the uh, late Dr. David H. Keller, who was extremely generous to fanzine editors. They gave away thousands of dollars of worth of his work, as, as Robert Block. Uh, Bob Tucker was a recipient of it at one time. It has gone to such names as I imagine would be meaningful to you, as uh, Harry Warner, Jr., and Rick Snary, the Joe Trimble, who's responsible for the creation of the uh, art shows as we know them. But it, it almost has come to a halt because after 15 or 16 uh, individuals receiving it, uh, it seems like the, the supply had rather dried up. Uh, they just don't make fans like E. Everett Evans anymore. He was a, a man who was very generous with his pocketbook if there had been any young fan outside tonight who perhaps couldn't afford the banquet and sometimes in the old days they didn't let you in at all unless you bought a ticket. Why, Evans would have been quite 
capable of picking up the tab for half a dozen fans. He was a, a creator of the National Fantasy Fan Federation and uh, instrumental in starting the Western Science Fiction Conferences, which have gone on to something like 28 or 30 of them in California. But I think that, uh, if you'll excuse the Tuckerian term, I have discovered virgin territory here in Australia because I've become aware of uh, three or four individuals, such as T.L. G. Cockcroft and uh, Ron Graham and uh, Donald H. Tuck, Mervyn Binns. I have a feeling that that uh, these Australians and Tasmanians uh, will. <laughs> <laughs> what I say? What I say? <laughs> hmm? One country? Oh. <laughs> Uh, that, that it's very possible that sometime in the future uh, one of them will be receiving the Big Heart Award. I'll have to amend that. Uh, one of them will not be receiving it in the future because he's going to receive it right now. And I'm, I'm very unhappy that he is not present. Actually, I believe I've been filling his place at this table of honor here, which Donald H. Tuck should have been sitting here, and I would like to ask his very good friend, Ron Graham, to come up on his behalf and accept the Big Heart Award. Did you hear that, Ron? Well, I tell you what, I'm going to fly over personally to Tasmania and, and take it to him, but I'll let you guard it until Tuesday, Ron. <laughs> Corey, I can tell you and the audience that seeing this award at a Don Tuck gives me as much, if not more, pleasure than it would Don Tuck. Don has been my friend for many, many years, more than I care to remember. He's been a sterling worker for science fiction over the whole of that period. And I should say, if anyone deserves this award, it's Don Tuck. And I'm extremely grateful to think that he's getting it, and pleased to think that he's getting it. And Corey, as you're going over there, I'll hand it over to your safekeeping to hand it on. Ah, uh, gee, my fellow Australians. Um, we now come to an item which is cryptically um, uh, mentioned on this uh, little list that I have in front of me. Would you like me to sing it? Um, it just says, Bankson to present. And I'm not too sure what that means. I think it's some kind of funny business. <laughs> um, but actually it's not. It's not funny business at all. Um, at the World Convention in Toronto two years ago, um, I gather Somebody can correct me later. Don't correct me now because, you know, I don't know what I'm going to say anyway. Um, but this is, um, I gather that during the convention, this is something that does happen from time to time. It's happened to me at this convention, but I won't go into any detail. You'll know what I'm talking about. Um, during a con convention, you discover that somebody that you have loved and admired through his work has died and it's sort of a sobering effect on a, has a sobering effect on a, an occasion like this and at Toronto I gather the word got around that J.R.R. Tolkien had died and from that one of the immediate responses and it's a typical sort of fanish response involving everything that is summed up in words like love and respect and admiration and a whole lot of other things. There came to be an award called Grandmaster of Fantasy. In short, the Gandalf Award. Um, it is my honor this year to present the second Gandalf Award. The first, the fans voted it. The fans are twits, but the fans voted it. 
the first award, maybe, uh, look, I'll take back that word, twits, but the first year, um, the fans said, well, Tolkien has to have the award, even though he's not around anymore. Um, you know, we're like that. Um, so this year, the, the second Gandalf Award is to be presented, and I have in front of me um, a list of the people who were nominated for this award, and um, I don't know who's won it, but the David Grigg knows. I don't know. But for the second Grandmaster of Fantasy Award, the nom nominees were Paul Anderson, Al Sprague de Camp, Ursula K. Le Guin, Fritz Leiber, and C.S. Lewis. I'm now going to ask David to hand me the envelope and I'll tell you who won it. This envelope is labelled Commonwealth of Australia. It's <laughs> not claimed... <laughs> the second Gandalf Award goes to Fritz Leiber. <laughs> and I'm going to ask Bob Silverberg to accept the on Fritz's behalf. <laughs> well, I, I live in California, and so does Fritz. And I guess I'm... I'm uh, I have a little air freight problem. <laughs> 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 and I would say this is about uh, two kilos. Uh, Grandmaster Fantasy Award, 1974. Fritz Leiber presented at Aussie Melbourne, 1975. I will try to give it to Fritz next week. Just for a little change in pace, uh, there's a note here that says Bankson to present. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still not sure what that means. <laughs> you know, in agricultural circles, John Alderson will tell you what that means. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not about to do it. <laughs> But it is, it is a great privilege for me um, to realise, you know, suddenly, now that I've, I've read through this stuff, to realise that, that I am going to present the um, John W. Campbell Memorial Award for 1974. Again, I don't know. Look, you've got to believe me. I really don't know who's going to win anything. <laughs> you know, I'm scared stiff. <coughs> um, I might miss out. Um, <coughs> this year the um, people nominated for the John W. Campbell Memorial Award um, and I'm not going to explain what the John W. Campbell Memorial Award is all about because I'm going to ask the person who accepts the award uh, to explain what it's about because he knows more about it than I do um, the people nominated were Alan Brennett Susie McKee Chana. Felix Gottschalk, Brenda Pierce, P.J. Plaga, and John Varley. And the committee will now hand me <laughs> the winner. <coughs> and the winner of the John W. Campbell Memorial Award for 1974 is P.J. Plaga, and I'm going to ask Ben Bover to come up here and accept it. I'm also going to ask him to tell you about it. Thank you. All the photographers happy? <coughs> For those of you who are not too familiar with this, um, we instituted this award at Condé Nast, asked the fans to vote for it, um, because although John Campbell is known for many things in science fiction, I think the thing that he did most and where his heart was was in developing new writers. And uh, this is just a uh, means for the fans to encourage new writers and to honor them. Bill Plogger uh, has only written a few stories so far, but I think each one that he's, uh, he's produced has 
been constantly better, a quantum leap each time. And he's got a new novel coming out uh, that you'll like a lot, I'm sure. So on his behalf, thank you very much. Um, now we come to the part that I really like. Um, let's just see whether I, I've got through all this stuff. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. Oh, God, item number one was uh, present Oscar. <laughs> Which one is Oscar, would you please? <laughs> um, it tells me now, ask Robin Johnson to come up to present something or other. Robin Johnson. Would you like anything from the uh, takeaway food bar? Or, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I'll have a bucket of chips. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether we're doing this in the same order as these things are usually done. Uh, various people lobbied us about the, the sequence of the awards. As far as I can see, this is completely different. Uh, what I have in front of me is a, is a plaque which lists the name of someone that... Uh, I'll just read what it says on here. It says, Committee Award to Donald A. Walheim, the fan who has done everything, writer, editor, publisher. And I'm going to ask John Lundry, as chairman of the Worldcon in 1977, that was recently chosen here, to come up and accept it and pass it on to Walheim when he gets back to the USA. Speaking in for Don Walheim, on his behalf, all I can really do is say thank you. Thank you all. There are two committee awards this year. Maybe I should first just explain about these committee awards. Uh, uh, it sounds like I shouldn't have explained about the committee awards. We have one of these committees that's pretty anarchistic, and I really did try to be democratic about this. <laughs> I really did try. I circulated all the committee, and people who know the way we operate know that that's quite expensive in this country. Half of them, or nearly half of them, are not in Melbourne. And I got a very slight response because I listed my nominees. This means no one disagreed. That was the way the thing was set up. And I'll just read out what it says. Committee Award to Walt Lee for Reference Guide to Fantastic Films. Now I'll ask Fred Patton, who works for the same organization in Los Angeles, to come up and accept it. I'd like to thank you all on behalf of Walt Lee for this. For those of you who are not familiar with uh, the work in question, uh, you can take, uh, see a copy of it in the uh, Space Age book room. But this is a 20-year project on, behalf on, uh, Walt's, uh, 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 on Walt's part, yes. Uh, he has always been interested in fantastic films, and he has always been a bibliographer type, and he has spent 20 years gathering all the information he could on fantastic films from all over the world, and he has finally, during the last three years, published all that information in three very nice volumes. And it is probably the most complete uh, collation of information on fantasy films done. And he, he doesn't really consider it done. He considers it a preliminary edition, the sort of thing that you've got to publish to convince some people that you're serious uh, enough that they will give you more of the information that uh, you're asking for. So he'll appreciate this for what he's done so far. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, my fellow fans, this is the moment that you've been waiting for. Thing 
Matilda, waltzing Matilda, you'll come a waltzing Matilda with me. And he sang as he jumped up, that Billy Billy Bull, you'll come a waltzing Matilda with me. We are now past the moment you're all waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I have a little item on the program here that says um, Hugo Awards and... Um, <laughs> yeah, I've got that bit too, but it's in italics on my copy. <laughs> and there's a whole lot of uh, incredible instructions here, but... Um, Look, I'm determined to set a world record because, um, you know, I want to be a multimedia science fiction personality like Norman Gunston is in the real world. <laughs> and, uh, and by God, we're going to get through these quick. Um, you don't need me to explain the Hugo Awards, do you? Do you really? Right, well... The, um, we decided we would do it our way. And we've got a lot of H Hugo Awards to um, give out here. And um, uh, one of them's got my name on it, but it's, you know, I, I did that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's made of plastic. And we start... We start with a streamer, we probably finish up that way. We start with the best short story for 1974. And the short stories that were nominated for the Hugo Award for best short story in 1974 were A Cathedonian Odyssey by Michael Bishop, The Day Before the Revolution by Ursula K. Le Guin, The Four Hour Fugue by Alfred Bester, The Whole Man, with an H, no W in front of it, by Larry Niven, and uh, Schwartz Between the Galaxies, that's probably pronounced Schwartz or something like that in America, by Robert Silverberg. I, these names keep cropping up, and um, I'm going to ask the committee to hand me the envelope where it says that I won the best short story for the war. <laughs> Isn't this exciting? Hugo Award for the Best Short Story of 1974 goes to Larry Niven for The Whole Man. <laughs> and I'm going to ask Bruce Pearls to come up and accept this award. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Bruce Pearls. Um, he's my older brother. By three hours, you <laughs> something or other? <laughs> On behalf of Larry, thank you very much to all the people who voted and to the entire convention. I think this time he's going to be surprised. <laughs> the second category we decided on was um, the best Tonight Show, but that got crashed somehow. <laughs> they wouldn't let me get away with it. So the second category that we're talking about is the Hugo Award for the Best Novelette of 1974. And the nominees, there's a whole lot of them. Harlan Ellison for A Drift Just Off the Islets of Langerhans Latitude, 38 degrees, 54 degrees north. Long I don't want to read all that stuff. <laughs> By Harlan Ellison. Um, Richard Lupoff, After the Dreamtime. Kate Wilhelm, A Brother to Dragons, A compa Companion to Owls. Jerry Pennell, Extreme Prejudice. That seems rather fitting. <laughs> I hope she wins it. Um, Fritz Leiber, Midnight by the Morphe Watch. William Walling, Nix Olympica. And uh, there's a, a new writer, um, a chap named um, Isaac Asimov, that thou art mindful of him. We were mindful of him. Uh, <laughs> And th these are the people who are nominated for Best Novelette of 1974 and in 15 seconds...
I'll tell you that there's no slip of paper in here at all. But <laughs> I just knew this was going to happen. The winner of the Hugo Award for Best Novelette 1974 is Harlan Ellison with a drift just off the ears of all that stuff, and I'm going to ask Robert Silverberg to come back here. <laughs> Uh, Bob, they tell me, they tell me they fitted the entire title onto this, <laughs> this thing. <laughs> they did. <laughs> uh, I, I had thought when I was bringing the Chandler Award in this direction, I'd be, be getting rid of some weight <laughs> on this 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 flight. Uh, in 1967, uh, one year they made the Hugos out of very light plastic. This was made out of very heavy metal. <laughs> <laughs> However... It's Mount Gambia Bluestone. Mount Gambia Bluestone. That's uh, very, very esoteric. Uh, <laughs> earlier this year, uh, the, the Science Fiction Writers of America awarded me a, a nebula for one of my stories, and the awards were given out in New York City. I did not plan to go to that award ceremony, and I asked Harlan, who uh, was going, to pick up my nebula for me. <laughs> and he said quite offhandedly, well, yeah, I'll do it, uh, provided you'll pick up my Hugo for me in Australia, because I'm not going. <laughs> <laughs> now, the interesting thing about that is that this uh, colloquy took place last April, the Hugo voting uh, was concluded in July. Evidently, the fix was in, because... <laughs> <laughs> However, I did promise, and uh, I will with, with mixed feelings, uh, <laughs> take, uh, take this, this Hugo back to Harlan, who is, of course, one of my oldest and dearest friends, and uh, who hasn't won one of these for a year or so. <laughs> The um, nominees in the category of Best Novella for 1974 were Jack Vance for Assault on a City. Um, I can't quite pronounce this name. Uh, Robert uh, um, Silverberg, Born with the Dead. Norman Spinrad for Riding the Torch. George Double R. Martin, A Song for Liar. And, oh, I've been taught how to pronounce this name and I've forgotten already. Um, I've never read any of this stuff. <laughs> oh, God. Um, Gardner Dozois. Am I wrong? Dozois. Right. Gardner Dozois for uh, L'Etagère. No, sorry, Strangers. really is exciting. I've never done this before. <laughs> you know, except when I write for a job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you apply for a job and you get all this stuff in the mail, you open that and you think, you know, <laughs> you've got it. Um, George Martin has won the <laughs> best novella for a song of liar and I'm going to ask Ben Berber to accept. You've been here before. Yes. <laughs> On George's behalf, thanks an awful lot. Uh, you finding this exciting? It's you know, um, yeah, for a seventy-two vintage, it's all right. But I'm not finding it exciting. Uh, we next come to the uh, Hugo for the best... Did I tell you what the Hugos are about? No, I didn't. Uh, the Hugo for the best dramatic presentation of 1974, and there's a whole lot of films that I've never seen. Uh, the committee just reminds me that I've skipped one. Uh, 
there's um, <coughs> a little category that I hadn't noticed. You know, I hope I filled in mine on the ballot, but um, I overlooked it, and it's called Best Novel. <coughs> and the nominees for Best Novel were Ursula K. Le Guin for The Dispossessed, Paul Anderson, Paul Anderson for Fire Time. They all deserve clapping, believe me. Go on, go for your life. <laughs> Philip K. Dick for Flow My Tears, the policeman said. <laughs> A gentleman who once wrote for Australian Science Fiction Review, Christopher Priest for The Inverted World, <laughs> which he must have sent to a more reliable publisher. And Larry Niven and Jerry Pornell for The Moat in God's Eye. <laughs> the winner of the Hugo Award for Best Novel 1974 is Ursula K. Le Guin, and I'm going to ask. I'm sure Ursula regrets uh, not being able to finish out the evening, but not half as much as I regret it for her. And I can only say for her what she would prefer to say herself. Thank you very much. Is there anyone who doesn't know who that was? It was Professor Charles Le Guin, um, who's married to somebody who writes this crazy science fiction stuff. <laughs> uh, now we're getting down to the real stuff. Uh, best dramatic presentation. And as I was saying, I haven't seen any of these, so I'm not the least bit biased. Um, the, um, the works, if I might put it that way, you know, I'm a little bit biased against this sort of stuff. Um, the works that were nominated for um, best dramatic presentations 1974 were uh, Flesh Gordon, um, <laughs> Phantom of the Paradise, <laughs> The Fourth Norman Gunsman Show, <laughs> no I'm sorry I, I that, that's just a note on, on this thing I, I, I wanted to ask you you know whether you'd seen The Fourth no Norman Gunsman <laughs> Show that's not really on the list it should have been, but um, <laughs> maybe next year. Uh, the Quester Tapes. <laughs> Young Frankenstein, named Frank for short. <laughs> and Zardoz. <laughs> and the winner is Norman Gunston. <laughs> Um, I'd like to ask the committee where they get all these Commonwealth of Australia envelopes from. <laughs> <laughs> I would like um, young Corey Ackerman to come up here and uh, present the award for best D dramatic presentation for 1974 in Young Frankenstein. Well, I'll just say thanks on behalf of Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. I'm sure she appreciates it very much. Um, <coughs> one, two, three, four, we're going well. How are we going on the world record, by the way? I think we're doing pretty well. Um, the best professional editor of 1974 was John Bankson, but he didn't get on to it um, because, he, you know, a, the Australian Government Publishing Service doesn't rank as a science fiction <laughs> fan team.
The Australian government has a promise of things to come. <laughs> what more could you ask? I'm not here, but nevertheless, um, the people nominated for Best Professional Editor 1974 were, um, I'm sorry, again, I'm going to have difficulty uh, with pronunciation, but um, you'll forgive me. Uh, <laughs> somebody's been reading next week's Locust. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Jim Bain, is that how you pronounce it? Right, fine. Ben Bober, Terry Carr, Ed Furman, Bob Silverberg, and Ted White. And the best professional editor, in the opinion of David Grigg and a multitude of other people who filled in these forms, is Ben Boba. <laughs> Who else, Ben? On my behalf, thank you. <laughs> Sands in the wind, they'll all be history one day. Um, we come down to the part that I know nothing about. We move immediately on to um, the best professional artist for 1974, and we have Stephen Fabian, Frank Kelly Fries, I learned to pronounce that today, um, Tim Kirk, John. Look, I'm still confused about this, but uh, Fori Ackerman tells me that it's, it's pronounced Skana, and I don't believe him. I don't believe it's pronounced Shonher or something like that. Uh, it means roughly beautiful mister. Anyway, John Shonher and Rick Sternbach, and um, I'm going to ask the committee to hand me the little stolen Commonwealth envelope that... Uh, does anyone realise that every member of this committee um, is a public servant or has been or will be or <laughs> <laughs> the best professional artist for 1974 and I'm going to ask Ben Bover to come up once again is Frank Kelly Freeze <laughs> No, really, Ben, how do you pronounce it? Freeze. Fair enough. Right. I've often said analog is Kelly's fanzine, and <laughs> every year he proves it. Thank you. Well, having talked about best professional artist, in, in science fiction, of course, um, it's very difficult to decide between uh, professional artists and fan artists and they worked out some kind of um, system uh, for deciding whether you'd be on one lot or not. God, have you seen all that stuff that Ben Bova's got in front of him over there? <laughs> yeah, somebody's going to light him in a minute and they'll take off. <laughs> the, um, there is some formula for working out um, uh, whether a person is regarded as a fan artist or a professional artist. F to me, they all seem professional, you know, except, um, except David Grigg. <laughs> I've seen some of his stuff. <laughs> <coughs> the, um, the people nominated as best fan artist uh, for 1974 were George Barr, Grant Canfield, Bill Rutzler and yeah. James Schull. Nobody got a clap then. <laughs> but bloody hell, I'm going to clap for the winner. It's Bill Rotzler. I'm going to ask for the If this keeps up, I'm going to tell the wombat joke. Well, the story here, not the Wombat story, but the <laughs> Rotzler story, uh, I generally go to the Worldcon each year, and Bill, who uh, lives in California, uh, very rarely goes to the Worldcon each year. And every year, 
Bill Rothstar is nominated for Best Fan Artist, and every year he says, uh, just in case I win, please pick it up for me. And this year he would. Now that Bill Rothwell's got his, there's a chance for me. Um, how many have we done, David? All but two. All but two. Yeah. Uh, this is one I'm, I'm a little bit embarrassed about, but we needn't go into that. Um, the best fan writer for 1974 is one of the following five people, and we just happen to have uh, one of them at the microphone and, uh, and two in the audience. Um, the people nominated were uh, Modesty Forbids, um, Richard Geis, Sandra Measle, Don Thompson, who's somewhere around here, Susan Wood, who's obviously around here. And I'm about to tell you the bad news. Why? This is not just exciting, this is... What is ever say? Best fan writer for 1974 was Richard E. Geis, and I'm going to ask Br Bruce Coles to come up and accept this award. <laughs> and explain how the hell he got it. Don't look at me, I only pick up Geis' Hugo's for him. <laughs> I don't vote for him anymore. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Uh, I'll get this up to Portland somehow. Uh, I may even consider how to deliver it to him personally. Hmm. <laughs> I just knew that somewhere in this convention there was going to be something absolutely brilliant, and that was it, and if you didn't get it, well... I can't do that yet. <coughs> this is the really important stuff. The best amateur magazine, it says here, but you and I know that that means the best bloody fanzine in the world. Uh, with some exceptions. Um, the nominations for the best fanzine of 1974 were The Alien Critic, Richard Geis, Al Gol, Andy Porter, Locust, Dina and Charlie Brown, Outworlds, Bill Bowers, Thank you. Um, SF Commentary, Bruce Gillespie. Come on, let's hear it for Bruce Gillespie, whether he wins or not. You wonder why I put this, this category last? I just wanted Bruce to sit there trembling, wondering when they'd get round to the fans end. And um, the other nomination was that marvelous fans end, Starling, by Hank and Leslie Luttrell. David Grigg has written all these stolen Commonwealth up, Commonwealth envelopes upside down so that, you know, <laughs> I keep catching the razor blade every time I open one. And would you believe it, the best amateur magazine for 1974 was The Alien Critic by Dick Geist, and I'm going to ask Bruce Pearls to come up again. <laughs> And you've got to say more this time, Bruce. I think after this I shall take up a collection to put <laughs> Geis out of business one way or the other, even if we have to buy him out. <laughs> My only difficulty with this is I'm afraid he only changed the title again and go on. <laughs> and <he's laughs> Thank you very much on behalf of Geis. Now maybe if I can find some way we can use these things for JATO or something and fly up to Portland, I don't know. <laughs> Are there any other questions you would like me to ask you? <laughs> is, there, is, is there anyone who's got any awards to present or do anything like that? Who's got awards to present? Who's up there? No. Oh. I think we've run out of awards and I think we've set a world record for handing out awards. And I commend myself on being the fastest award giver in the history of world conventions. <laughs> no, 
uh, Robin Johnson will give evening meditation. I give it to he's taken half of it already <laughs> Australia we're all out for 135 England are now none for 23 <laughs> there's a color TV uh, there's a color TV in suite 1500 and I would think the first 135 people might just squeeze in to watch it and I suggest you start moving right now <laughs> 